How's it going, Mana Church? Welcome to our Good Friday online service. Wherever you may be, let's join and worship together.
Anna Online family, thank you for joining us today. My name is Anna Wiggins, and I want to welcome you to our Good Friday service, part of our Easter at Mana experience. Our Passion Week experiences began yesterday with our Maundy Thursday service. If you missed that powerful time of worship in the Word, I want to encourage you to go back and check that service out on our YouTube page. If you were with us yesterday, then you know just how special that experience was. Now, perhaps you missed the experience yesterday because today is your first time joining us for a Mana Church experience. We are thrilled to have you as our guest today. If you would, text the word guest to the number that you see on your screen. If this is your first time with us, we'd love to connect with you. Now, you can also, if you're watching on our webpage, mana.church, you could either text the word guest or you could simply click the button underneath the screen that says first time guest. We look forward to connecting with you outside of this experience and answering any questions that you may have about Mana Church. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope this won't be your last time with us. We worship God in many ways here at Mana Church, and we wanna to continue to worship through our tithes and offerings. Giving to God a portion of our finances is something that we do as a demonstration that God and His ways are first in our lives. That's why we call this an act of worship. Now, at Mana Church, we've worked really hard to make giving really simple for you. So we have various ways in which you can give. If you currently give online through the web or the app, continue to do so. But if you're looking for a way to give online today, you could consider giving via PayPal by texting the word MANA to the number that you see on your screen. If you'd like to write a check, make it out to Mana Church and you can drop it in the mail or drop it off at our Cliffdale site. Now, if you are our guest today, please don't feel any obligation to give financially. Mana Church, thank you for your continued generosity. Would you join me in praying for our offering today? Lord, we come before you and we bring our tithes and offerings. Lord, we bring this gift, just a small token, Lord, of what you've given to us, a small portion of it. Lord, everything that we have comes from you, Lord, and we give it back to you. Lord, we wanna honor you with our finances. We wanna honor you with our lives. In Jesus' name, Lord, we ask that you would bless this, that you would use it to advance your kingdom all around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're gonna continue in a time of worship together through song, and then we'll have today's message. from heaven's throne 
acquainted with our sorrow to trade the debt we owe your suffering for our freedom the Lamb of God in my place your blood pours
see my Jesus. I see my Jesus. Eyes blind with blood. His face is crimson. And his cry is love. Come on, we sing no wonder.
Almost 2,000 years ago, Pontius Pilate had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Once handed over, the governor's soldier stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. Then they mocked him, spit on him, and beat him. After they had mocked him and put his own clothes on him, they led him to be crucified. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, people passed by and hurled insults at him, saying, Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. About three that afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the temple curtain was torn in two. An earthquake shook the ground, and many holy people were raised to life. The guards standing around Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, and in terror exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. It had to be this way. There was no other way, no other option. No one else was capable. No other answer would be sufficient. For 33 years, he had never sinned. He was completely perfect. He was completely pure. He hadn't had a rash moment. He'd never snapped at anybody, never lapsed into wrong or inappropriate anger. No, complete perfection. Beyond that, his motives had always, for every action, in every moment, been right. For 33 years, he kept 613 laws recorded in the Torah. And not just the laws. He himself had extended the laws. He perfectly kept the law, but not just the law, the spirit behind the law. He was flawless, but he wasn't just flawless. He was also righteous. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 starts out this way. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him. John gets it. John's like, I'm a sinner. You have never sinned. He knew that Jesus didn't need to repent and be baptized. It was a baptism of repentance. He was already perfect. Thus, we see John's reticence. John said, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill, wait for it, all righteousness. Then he, John, consented. Okay, I'll baptize you, Jesus. Jesus was flawless, but he wasn't just sin-free. He had fulfilled all righteousness. The Greek word for all there, this right Jesus is saying that I fulfill all righteousness, is every. It's each. It's the whole. He wasn't partly righteous. He was all the way righteous. He couldn't be more righteous nor could he be less righteous. He was all righteous. He fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. You know, in our study, I see that as at least 63 discrete prophecies that find their fulfillment in Jesus. Some scholars list as many as 300. Jesus did all of them. He walked them out. He did thousands of miracles and healings, casting out demons, prophesying over people, speaking to a person's motive or heart or understanding this or that. All of his deeds you think of, all the kindness. If you imagine Jesus is the kindest person anyone had ever met. He always does good. All of the service that he did, etc. all that stuff piling up demonstrations of how perfect he was, not just in not sinning, but in earning, doing all the good things. John 21 verse 25 says, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. You couldn't do more good than Jesus did. And he'd never done a single thing wrong. It had to be this way. No one has ever deserved to die less, but Jesus had to die. Why? It all started right at the beginning with one simple rule. We find that rule in Genesis chapter 2. 
And the Lord God commanded the man. God is talking to Adam. He's created him and he's giving him his job. And at the same time, he's giving him the rules. Here it is. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Don't eat. It's the simplest of commands. We know the story. Adam ate and sin entered the world. And here's the result. You can find it in Romans chapter five. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. What was true for Adam has been true for all of us. We're all guilty of sin. Sure, we've sinned in the big ones and we know that. Our, our conscience, our heart tells us where we have, but also in the small ones. Every one of us has been guilty of something seemingly as small as don't eat, don't touch, don't look. We've told our kids that, don't touch that outlet. Don't do this thing. Don't say that word. Don't eat this chocolate before you have dinner. We've all touched, we've all eaten, and we've all looked and beyond. In Adam's case, a simple don't eat turned into so much more immediately. We know the story. There's Adam, he takes a bite of that fruit, his eyes are opened, immediately shame enters the picture. And he looks at Eve and she looks at him and all of a sudden they realize they're naked and they go, we've got to cover up. So it went from don't eat to an immediate cover up. And so he cowers and runs away in shame and then he hides and God shows up what happened and, and Adam is trying to hide from God, he's trying to deceive and then he shifts the blame. We know the process. It is, it was our process too. Sin is completely wrong. It's completely corrupting. It's completely defiling. It's completely damning. And not just in total. It's not a lifetime of sin that is completely wrong, completely damning, completely corrupting. It's for every sin. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, For everyone who keeps the whole law, do everything else right, but fails in one point, has become guilty of all of it. To sin one time is to sin completely. It's not mostly good and a little not okay. It is sin makes us all wrong. And one sin is never enough. It always takes us deeper than we want to go. I was pondering this, and I thought of how sobering it is to realize that humanity in Adam went from don't eat to murder in just one generation. Adam and Eve's oldest son, Cain, murders their second son, Abel. You'd wish for more from us, surely, we could spend a longer time on something as simple and small as don't eat before we get into the taking of human life by another. But that's sin. That's the corruption. Sin is a horror of evil. It was, it is complete and eternal. And it needed complete and eternal payment as the consequence, the penalty for sin. This payment was... This payment is not one any individual can pay in this life. For you or for me to pay for our sins ourselves would require hell, an eternity outside of the presence of God, experiencing the right righteous punishment for every single sin you or I would ever commit. But God the greatest words we could ever hear. But God made a promise. In Genesis chapter three, verse 15, God said, as he spoke to the servant, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, we're talking about Jesus. 
He shall bruise your head. Another translation, he shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. Echoed and expanded through the Old Testament and into the Gospels, God promised a one who would step in and make things right. He promised a one who could carry our sins, who could make a trade that would free us. Jesus had to die because you, because I, because we sinned. There's no other way. It's Good Friday. Today we remember that day when Jesus laid down his life for our sins. Because we know the end of the story, there's always hope. But in reality, it's a somber day. It always, really, it should always have a weight. Because my sin, your sin, is real. It costs, it hurts. And Jesus had to die for your and my sins. Not our life of sin, for every single sin I have ever committed. For every single sin, every wrong thought, every wrong motive, every lustful attitude and action, every one he had to die. On a somber day, Good Friday, Let's ask a somber question. How do you kill the Son of God? That's the question for Good Friday. How do you kill the Son of God? If you have your Bible, I'd invite you now to turn to Matthew chapter 27, and we're gonna pick up the narrative at the end of Jesus' trial. Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. And so as Pilate encounters Jesus and he's brought in, he knows that Jesus hasn't done what the, the religious leaders have accused him of doing. So he's trying to come up with a strategy that preserved justice and satisfied the people. But there's no way that justice could prevail on this day. So looking at Jesus and every person who experienced Jesus realized that he was something else, that he was something special. You can see if you study this and understand what's happening that Pilate's mind is blown. Here are people accusing Jesus of all this stuff and here is Jesus and he never defends himself. Pilate knows that Jesus knows that he's got to make a defense. If he makes no defense, it's like saying, yeah, sure, I'm guilty, but something about Jesus and his his carriage and his perfection and, and how amazing he is and that he is God in the flesh. Pilate can see something's not right here. He's trying to figure it out. In my mind, it's like the tension of that moment and that day is crackling. Everybody knows an epic is unfolding. Something is happening, but Pilate can't quite figure it. So he chose a path that would be expedient for him and would mollify the crowd. The most innocent man ever would be sentenced to a horrible death. Verse 24, it says that when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, he's been trying, trying to figure out a solution and answer. What can I do that will make everybody know that this guy you don't like has been punished, but I don't have to kill him and you'll go away happy. He's gaining nothing, but rather... That a riot was beginning. That's what he really feared. It wasn't that he wanted that much that it would be a just moment, a just outcome. He wanted to be safe himself. When he saw a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd and said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. He tried to put it back on them, but they know that they can't execute Jesus. That's not legal. Verse 25, all the people answered, his blood be us and on our children. And he, then he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. But wait, because there are three words there that might be easy to run past, but they're saturated with meaning. What are those three words? Having scourged Jesus. Scourging was a horrible and brutal practice. It was done with a, a flagellum, which is 
We might think a whip, but it's really a rod with some leather ends attached, leather straps attached and embedded, tied into those leather straps or pieces of bone and iron. And so that what would happen is the person, the victim of the scourging would be tied over a stump so their back was stretched out. And then the whipping that would occur would not simply be a beating. Instead, it would be a flaying as the lictor would whip and, and really allow the, the, the leather ends of the flagellum to, to kind of wrap around and sink into the skin and the tissue, etc. And then he'd yank back and literally the skin and the sinew and pieces of bone would be pulled and, and yanked off of Jesus' body. The Jews would use 39 blows. This wasn't an uncommon punishment, but... They'd call it the 40 minus 1, 39 blows. The Romans were not so limited. This is called, by the Romans, it's called the half death. And there was an idea, a purpose behind this particular punishment. It was designed to permanently alter the recipient. The person who had been scourged in this way would be disabled for the rest of their life. No one who walked by them would not know that they had been scourged. The idea is don't ever do what this person did. Otherwise, you'll experience this life-changing, life-altering punishment. The evidence would be there in the scars, which would be on the back, but would have wrapped onto the chest, even the face, all over where they would have been flayed. This scourging in and of itself could have easily killed him. Sometimes the person scourged would in fact die from it, but that's not what killed Jesus. Then the soldiers, verse 27, of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his, put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. They scourged him, they beat him, they abused him, they mistreated him, they mocked him. Verse 32, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry his cross, to carry Jesus' cross. This scourging that I just described and the beating were close to killing him, so close that he couldn't even carry his cross. And when I say he couldn't carry his cross, he would have been tasked with carrying the, the, the side beam, if you will, one beam of the cross, the main post, would have already likely been at the place of crucifixion, which sometimes people believe that the crucifixion would have occur, occurred far out of town. We've got that picture in our head of this hilltop that looks over Jerusalem in a distance, but that's not the point of a crucifixion. A crucifixion, they want to happen at the center of where people go back and forth. The idea of a crucifixion is to keep a people oppressed. So everybody who walks along and sees the brutality, the horror of what happens in crucifixion is cowed down. This would not have been that far from where Jesus was sentenced to where he was crucified and yet he couldn't carry it himself. So Simon carrying that side beam, that cross beam, if you will, and Jesus and the rest. In verse 33, when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. When he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. He wanted to keep his wits about him. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Crucifixion, we must know, is a most brutal of death sentences. A lot of times in our mind, we see this happening uh, kind of in, in a way raised up, like everybody looks up really high to see this cross that's way up there. But the truth is it was low. He was accessible, maybe two feet off of the ground is where this would have happened. And so he would be nailed to the cross beam through each 
wrist and that cross beam would have a notch in the middle of it. So the main post already having been set in the ground, they'd take the cross beam with Jesus attached to it and lower it with the, the notch inside onto the main beam. And then just between his second and third toe, about two inches up in between those two toes, his knees would be bent and his feet would be placed together and a nail would go through both feet in that same spot into the beam. The death of crucifixion is a death of asphyxiation. It's a struggle to breathe. As Jesus would slump down, the air would be expressed as his diaphragm was compressed. And so in order to breathe, he'd have to struggle pulling against those nails through his wrists and, wrists and pushing with his feet on the nail uh, that's, that's in both of his feet. He'd push himself up in order to breathe. And as long as he could hold against that searing pain in his wrists and his feet, he'd be upright breathing and he'd slump back down and the air would come out again. And so he'd struggle to right himself and pull himself up and breathe. It's a brutal, horrifying death. A person crucified couldn't protect himself. He's vulnerable to blows as people come by and throw things at him and mock him and assail him and poke him and slap him and hit him. Whatever a person would want to do and birds of prey, bugs, the elements, etc. He can't wipe his face. He can't push something away. He's completely exposed, completely open. It was agonizing and slow. It should take somewhere from six hours to four days for a person to die. As they, the desire to live would be so strong so they'd struggle. And everybody who walked by would say, I don't want that. What does it take for me to not have that? Crucifixion would have killed him, but it didn't. Then they sat down. He's been crucified. He's on the cross in verse 36 and kept watched over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him saying, he saved others, he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I'm the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. It's kind of pause in that. He was very alone. Imagine everything that Jesus had been through. His disciples had abandoned him. They'd betrayed him. Peter denied him. He's all by himself. Everyone around him is glorying and so happy in this lot that has come to him. Here he is on the cross. Everyone is mocking him. Just a horrible, brutal, unworthy moment. Now from the sixth hour, that's about noon, there was darkness over all the land. See, at some point, the guilt of our sins had to be transferred to Jesus. Truth is, I've sinned, you've sinned. We know those sins. In reality, we've even forgotten many of our sins. We could name them, some of them we remember, some of them we remember clearly, some of them like it was yesterday. But so many we've written off long in the past, long forgotten about. But at some point, that very real guilt, you and I sin, had to be transferred to Jesus. And I believe it was here in the midst of this darkness that went, I already said, from about noon, picking the verse back up until the ninth hour. That's about 3 p.m. Let's talk about guilt for a moment. We know that feeling of guilt. We know that sense, sometimes immediate, 
after you've sinned. Sometimes it's later when you realize you've sinned, when you, when you awaken to the reality of that sin. But we all know that sense of utter wrong. I did it. Wasn't anybody else's fault but mine. I made the choice. I took the action. It was wrong. For portions of our lives, we may have even made an uneasy truth with that sense, that feeling. Maybe in an area where it's so hard to put down. And so you sin and you feel that again and try to get away from it, but it's always there kind of at the back. When maybe we just said, okay, I'm living with this. But we know that feeling. Every one of us knows shame. I'm not trying to induce recrimination here, but just for a moment, I want you to pause. And I want you to remember that shame again. Think about it. Just right now. I sinned there. In that season. For that time. What it felt like. Think back to those moments where you knew that you were the chief of sinners. Think about that disgraceful, unholy, unqualified, unworthy feeling where you know you should be cast away, where you're fully aware of how unrighteous, how unperfect you are. Now, we remember that feeling. We, we know what it feels like. It's almost, yeah, I know what you're saying, Jonathan. Now I want you to imagine that feeling times every single sin that you've ever committed in a moment. That would be overwhelming. Every time I felt that shame, every time I've known myself, if it all happened for my whole life in a moment, what would that be like? But then, what would that be like if it weren't just my sin, if it were my sin and your sin, the two of our lifetimes of sin experienced in a moment. And what if it weren't just you and me? What if in that moment you had that feeling time every single sin for every single person who would believe in Jesus? That weight is beyond comprehension. You and I cannot even imagine what that would feel like in a moment. Now remember that for 33 years, Jesus has never felt that feeling one time. He was perfect for every moment of his life. That feeling wasn't familiar. It was brand new and it was for all at once. Oh, wow. Then remember that he had a perfect relationship with his father. I think of Jesus and what like was life for him. And I realized he was used to constant communication with God. He was always loved, always valued, always in communion. So that relationship, he does this thing and then he senses God is speaking to him. Even while he's healing this person, he's got that sense from God. He knows that over there they're thinking X, Y, and Z. And so he can be healing, led by God in a moment, turn and say, I know your thoughts. He's always got this dialogue going on with God. That sense of, I love you. I'm serving you. I value you you. I'm proud of you. It's constant. And now in a moment, utter silence. Jesus was used to the clatter of humanity all around. You think of those places where there's a whole crowd gathered and every one of them is shouting, Jesus, heal me. And in the midst of the clatter of humanity on the inside, a quiet, constant, deeper dialogue with God. For God's leading, now's the time to walk away. Now's the time to do this. Now's the time to do that. This is where you go. Now, here he is on the cross. There's outside clatter, but there's just outside clatter. What is he experiencing? Unbearable, unimaginable, undefinable shame and guilt and disgrace. 
We know that Jesus, anticipating this moment when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's sweating so much that, that, that he's, um, he's so stressed, excuse me, that he's sweating blood. And here he is on the cross and he's been traumatically beaten and he's been betrayed and he's broken hearted and his father is now silent and all this sin is there. And if there was ever a candidate for death from broken heart syndrome, I don't know if you know what that is, but that's a real medical condition where a person will experience a stress emotionally so deeply that it will cause them to have a heart attack and die. If there's ever a candidate from death in that moment, Jesus would be it. Literally, the shame of every one of your sin and my sin times everyone, that shame and that pain and that anguish could have killed him. But it didn't. Verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemach sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is pure anguish. He is bereft of God's presence. He's racked with agony of body, soul, and spirit. And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man's calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Any of the previous elements could have killed Jesus, but they didn't. Something else was happening. Something had been building since the first human sin. And if you want me to be real, it had built from every sin, every past sin, every present sin of all those around Jesus and every sin that you or I would commit in the future. There's only one outcome for sin. It's wrath. I know that we would love to believe that sin just goes away that it's in the past and it gets dealt with and it's just somehow it disappears. But there's just wrath as the answer for sin. God in his perfection, in his holiness, in his complete justice cannot abide sin. It must be dealt with. It must experience perfect, righteous, holy, consuming wrath. And yet, God's a patient God. We must realize he could have easily extinguished Adam with the tiniest flash of his wrath for sin, but God waited. God is slow to anger and abounding in mercy, but he is the perfection of justice and sin must be punished. The wrath of God must be satisfied. It had to be this way. Jesus had to die. Justice demanded payment. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. The wrath of God for every sin, every wrong motive, every wrong thought of those who had trust in Jesus burst forth and the supernatural and the natural collided. The power of God was on display. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split. And in a moment, the wrath of God for your sins and mine sounds satisfaction in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Friday night ended in seemingly bleak fashion. The enemy thought he triumphed, but Sunday is coming. We're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on Sunday morning right here, wherever you are watching Good Friday. If this service blessed you tonight, let us know by posting in the comment section or email us at contact at manna.church. As we leave each other tonight, there's still time to invite family and friends to join us as we celebrate Jesus' triumph on Easter Sunday morning. Share this link and we'll be right back here on Sunday morning, premiering as always at 8.15 and on demand following that. We'll see you then.